What is up, Popper players? Welcome back to another Salt and Popper Saturday video. And today we have an exciting new deck featuring one of the Dark Horse cards from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Let's jump into the deck. It's very exciting to see a dead archetype uh, come back to life with such vigor. And this has been really exciting to play lately. I've been stealing a lot of games with it. So let's jump into the deck tech and show you guys what we'll be playing this week. Alrighty guys, so what we are doing this week is we are playing Blue Green Infect. This is on the back of this card, Relics Roar. We will be showing off this brand new card from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. This is Relics Roar, and if you've watched my best of video, my top five video from a few weeks ago, you would know that this was one that I had picked that might have been a dark horse going into the format. And it gives you until end of turn for one blue mana target artifact or creature becomes a dinosaur artifact creature with base power and toughness for three in addition to its other types. Uh, this card isn't particularly powerful. We've seen uh, similar effects to this in the past. However, the addition of adding dinosaur and artifact to the card and creature types combos with another semi new card from Infinity Embiggen. And this allows you to give target non brush rag creature plus one plus one for each super type card type and subtype. And when you add that to both blighted agent, which is a creature Phyrexian human and rogue or to glistener elf, which is a creature Phyrexian elf warrior. If you add artifact and dinosaur, that makes six and for two mana, one blue and one green, you can give something 10 power it becomes a four three and then you give it plus six plus six that is a turn to kill potential now i know what you're saying in this format there are a lot of red decks it's going to get bolted a lot and that's true but against the mono blue deck that doesn't have a ton of early removal and very few snaps or echoing truths and things of that nature even boomerangs uh, are a little bit too slow against this deck, and you'll see that in our test games. But let's get through the rest of the list. It is on 20 land. It could probably be a little less, if I'm being honest. Um, the four Ash Barons and the one Lorien Reveal do a lot of reducing uh, the amount of lands in the deck total. You might even be able to cut two of these Ash Barons for two more Lorien Reveals, because strangely enough in the more controlly games sometimes it does go a little bit long and resolving a Lorien revealed can definitely give you options especially in a main board that's only running eight infect creatures and two non-infect creatures in cyber cryptomancer but we're running 20 lands we have four ash barons some forests some islands and a single tangled islet this is to get it from Lorien revealed uh, we have four Glistener Elves, four Rancors to provide those Glistener Elves some trample. We have one Shadow Rift to give target creature shadow, which means it cannot be blocked except by other creatures with shadow, so it becomes pseudo-unblockable. For Spell Pierce, uh, this is just a cheap, very efficient interaction spell that's going to stop a lot of those early Lightning Bolts, Boomerangs, things like that. Uh, for Snakeskin Veils, this is more removal. It gives a 1-1 counter and Hexproof to target creature until end of turn. This is, again, going to stop a lot of those Lightning Bolts, Boomerangs, pretty much any thing that's trying to kill your creature outside of a sacrifice is going to get whiffed by Snakeskin Veil. So we want tons of cheap interaction. You can see that here. We have four of the Spell Pierces, four of the Snakeskin Veils. We've got two to Spells. Similar to the Spell Pierces, but interacts with a little bit more in the metagame. So we have two here and another two in the sideboard against the decks we want them against. And then we have two Vines of Vastwood. This is a Pump Spell and a Snakeskin Veil in one, um, but it costs double green to do the pump. So it is a one mana uh, Hexproof spell and a two mana Hexproof and pump. Uh, this is only a two of here. We just don't need eight of those effects and we're pretty light on creatures already. So 
these two vines of asswoods could definitely go up to four by cutting these two cryptomancers uh but in general i like the two and two split we have four might of old crozier this is kind of old faithful for infect uh this is a plus two plus two at instant speed but if you cast it during your main phase it gives plus four plus four we have embiggen which is one of the namesake cards for this infect list and then we have relics roar this is kind of the turn two dream uh, two Cyber Cryptomancers. This is a flash creature that has backup one, so it allows you to put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature, uh, and then they gain its text box. Um, you can save creatures with this against removal. It is, by all measures, uh, just another snakeskin veil, but it costs blue and comes with a body, so it does help you against edicts. We have four Blighted Agents. This is kind of Old Faithful. Uh, two mana, one, one Infect that can't be blocked. And then we have a single Lorien Revealed. Like I said, the Ash Baron's Lorien Revealed mixture is a little uh, unsettled for me. Definitely could use some tweaks, but the list is a good base to start with, I think. Sideboard, we have four Annuls. This is basically just against an Infinity or Brute Squad or uh, Blue White Affinity, whatever you want to call it uh these are good against that it's also good against uh boggles but not really much seeing those and uh it's really not gonna do much in the face of this boggles gains a lot of life and kills very quickly but this deck can definitely race it and it doesn't have much removal so uh definitely something to um be aware of in the matchup you can race them pretty effectively Two more Dispels. This is really just against uh, the blue decks or really against the red decks if they have a lot of burn. Uh, but you also have four blue Elemental Blasts and most often you're going to be bringing those in. You have two Icker Clomers. This is against a lot of the like garden style lists that are going to be running Chainer's Edicts and lots of one for one removal. It just gives you more bodies to try to stick. And then Weather the Storm against some of the Pinger Burn or very kind of combo burn style that are just spilling out spells, uh, including the new kind of red one drops list that's running the uh, Tomb Raider Goblin. So definitely has a, a little bit of everything. For, uh, for most of the metagame. And then against that mono blue deck, you're probably just bringing in these two dispels and you have quite a bit of interaction against their removal. Those decks also I've found don't have very many blockers and if they do, uh, they're usually behind. So you can attack very quickly and effectively put a lot of pressure on those decks. But that's it for the deck tech guys. Let's jump in to the games i've got uh two games for you today one against big tron which is uh, a little bit of a dark horse also our uh, cascade tron as it used to be called one against mono blue uh which is mono blue delver and then a third and final kind of a bonus game which was a wacky game that was played uh by me during my test matches this week and i just want to let you guys see how that all plays out so stay tuned for that that's a way a weird weird game uh but <laughs> you're gonna want to see it because it was pretty entertaining um buckle up guys it's gonna be a fun time with some fast fast paced games and uh, don't forget to like the video before we jump into those games guys if you're enjoying the content we are so so close to that crucial 1000 number that's when you kind of made it uh and you're able to start monetizing the channel uh that does a lot for the effort and the production value and a lot of the other things for turning this channel into something that can continue to grow going forward and taking it from a hobby to a potential side hustle that I can start to allocate more time for. So really, really appreciate the growth on the channel, guys, and really appreciate uh, you all for your support. Uh, keep an eye out for merch that will be coming soon. I have some plans. Uh, and let's jump into those games, guys. Make sure you sub down below and uh, hit the video with a comment to boost the algorithm. Uh, let me know 
if you've been able to pull off the turn two, uh, it's a little bit of a dream, not gonna lie, but man, when you do it, when you do it, like, come on, this is pretty satisfying. Um, all right, guys, let's jump in to the games. Game number one, let's go. All right, guys, game number one against Xavier 12. Uh, we do win the die roll, which is always the goal. Let's see how the game goes. All right. Okay, so game number one, we are on the play. We open this hand. Uh, it is a little bit clunky, but we have interaction. We have a creature. We have a pump spell. This is definitely a keep from this deck. We're going to lead on an island and just pass the turnover. Opponent goes for a land expedition map. We are going to burn the spell pierce because we see an Urza's Mine as the uh, first land drop from the opponent. Definitely something I considered in the moment, whether or not it was worth it to save the creature. But as soon as I identified them on Tron, I uh, made the assessment that they weren't going to be running very many, if any, removal spells. Most Flicker Tron lists and Combo Tron lists just try to be hyper- uh, draw heavy and try to uh, get to their engine as quickly as possible. So I figured slowing them down with a uh, spell pierce here was ideal. And this is going to let me go into a, uh, a blighted agent on turn two pretty freely uh, because they won't be able to uh, spend their mana very uh, effectively and hopefully miss turn three Tron, which opens the door for me to put a lot of pressure on. We do go with the Blighted Agent here. Opponent untaps, has a second Tron piece, which is a little unfortunate. They're going to crack the star and play another Expedition map. We draw another creature, which isn't ideal here. Uh, we don't have a second green source. We could uh, cycle this Ash Barrens, but instead we play a Blighted Agent here and cycle it end of turn. This allows us to start the clock pretty quickly. Opponent on three. They do find Tron into a Muldrifter very quickly, though. It looks like they're just digging here. This is pretty standard Flicker Tron behavior so far. I hit a land here and just elect for the Lorien Revealed to go draw and uh, essentially just set up to kill them the next turn was the plan. Uh, we definitely hit enough pump spells to do that. Uh, opponent hits Muldrifter into... Maelstrom Colossus, and this is when we know we're up against Cascade Tron. Uh, they do have a snap in the main board, which is super strange, but they're only able to snap one Blighted Agent and uh, play another Muldrifter. Nothing to worry about there. Our Blighted Agent still can't be blocked, and they are very dead. And game over for game number one. Very, very smooth here. Like I said, uh, Tron in general doesn't tend to run much, if any, removal. If All we'd really have to dodge there is a moments piece or something like that. So, easy game one. Uh, second guessing the Spell Pierce play, now that the opponent had such a quick Tron draw and a lot of draw. Um, now that we see a removal in the form of Snap, it's definitely something... I would consider holding going into game number two. All right, game number two. Our sideboard plan is pretty simple here. We took out a couple of Vines of Vastwoods. We took out a couple of Cyba Cryptomancers. We brought in two Ichorclomers and the other two Dispels. This is really just uh, counting on being able to counter their removal or moments piece and uh, having more creatures so our draws are a little bit more consistent. Uh, Cryptomancer didn't seem super relevant because any and all of their interaction are going to be instants, so... We're just going to run the Dispels in their place and add a couple of creatures back in. But that's the sideboard play, and let's get going with game number two. This is the hand we open up. Uh, this is definitely a keepable hand. 
We have a Rancor, Double Pump Spell, Blighted Agent, Glistener Elf with two lands and both colors. This is 100% a keep. Uh, it is a little bit clunky because our blue mana is tapped. So if we want to play the Blighted Agent on two, we have to run a tap land out first. Um, that has its pros and cons. Uh, obviously, we want to turn one Glistener Elf here and hope that we top deck a land so we can put nine damage on the board on turn two. Uh, but we'll see what the chop deck is and run from there. This is definitely a key. Opponent goes down to four cards, which is crazy unfortunate from the opponent. We're going to draw a land, hit a Glistener Elf. Opponent leads on double Expedition Map, misses a land drop. We're going to pump hit for five, set up to kill next turn, and if opponent misses a land drop, they're in a lot of trouble, and they scoop it up. Uh, very quick showing from the Tron deck, but this matchup I do think is very favored to Infect. Um, so no real surprise there. Um, not 100% sure I'm bringing the Icker Clomers. Uh, I think that's maybe negligible against this matchup, but the Dispels were definitely correct just to uh, minimize their moments peace draws. But that's it for the first match. Very clean showing, very easy uh, into a good matchup. But let's take a look at a little bit harder matchup in Mono Blue Delver. Number two, this one is against Shark. Uh, they are going to be piloting Mono Blue Delver. This is a much more difficult and interactive matchup, so let's see how it goes. We unfortunately lose the die roll, so we are on the draw going into game number one. This is a very keepable hand, though. Once again, we have a one drop, we have a two drop, we have a pump spell, we have a disruption spell, and we have both colors. This is a dream keep from me, so let's run the game and see what happens happens opponent opens on an island that shows us pretty much what we're against there's a couple different options here but they're gonna thought scour which gives us the clue very immediately that they are on mono blue now at this point i elect to pass by not playing a glistener elf into one open island uh, potentially playing around Force Spike because that would shut me down for several turns. Um, in retrospect, I think against Mono Blue, you should be applying pressure as quickly as you can. I think that the less time they have to set up blockers, the less time they have to dig for their, you know, one of Echoing Truth or their two of Boomerang or, you know, things like that. Um, if they're not on a four Boomerang list, the better. And in general, they don't have a way to kill your creatures outside of countering them. So you want to get them down as quickly as possible because it makes them spend resources. Uh, and in general, you're going to get to replay your creatures. You've got spell pierces, you've got dispels, you've got things to fight their counter spells. So shouldn't be too afraid to run things out very quickly. I should have just run the Glistener Elf there, I think. Opponent just plays land and passes turn, and this is why... It's really awkward to not play the Glistener Elf there because now we can't really play effectively into this open counter spell without a Dispel or a Spell Pierce. We go for the Glistener Elf here. We get counter spell just like we expected, regretting not playing that Glistener Elf pretty much immediately. We actually missed the cycle trigger at the end of the turn there. A little bit of uh, sad but it doesn't hurt us too badly. Opponent is just digging here. And they're going to go ahead and lead with a Cryptic Serpent. We're going to cycle down and turn and flash in this Cryptomancer. Um, we were attempting to bait a Counterspell. It didn't actually work out, but we draw the Spell Pierce anyway. Turns out they didn't have one. They just let the Blighted Agent resolve and Mental Note at end of turn. So we are in a pretty good position. They lead with a second Cryptic Serpent, but looking at our hand here, we have... Uh, four, eight, nine damage total. Not a one turn kill unless we hit another pump spell, but something to always keep in mind. Opponent attacks, we're just going to block here to keep our life total up. This allows us to take a full hit next turn if we have to. Um, and this uh, Cyber Cryptomancer really isn't going to be providing any other utility now that it's on the board. So safe to use it as a chump blocker here. Considerations. Um, 
there is some amount of consideration for relics roaring here to trade with a cryptic serpent but in general i think that's going to be a losing fight so i elect to hold it and just go for the all in here we have a spell pierce so if opponent does have an echoing truth or a boomerang or something like that we have an answer for it unfortunately it does run into opponent spell pierce or dispel um but that's how you kind of have to play this match a little bit all inny sometimes um Anyway, we do elect to block here just to preserve our life total. We hit the Relics Roar. We hit the Might of Old Crozier. We attack for 8. Opponent does have the Boomerang, but we have a Spell Pierce. Opponent has a Spell Pierce of their own, but then we respond with Snakeskin Veil to give it Hexproof against the Boomerang. Once they were tapped out, they go to 9 Infect. We are at 20, they can only do 12 damage, and if they didn't hit another boomerang, it was game over. We do see a Murmuring Mystic from the opponent in that uh, in that discard, so keep in mind they are running a Murmuring Mystic variant that is very good to generate blockers against us, so that is something we have to consider going into the rest of our games against them. Uh, but a very clean game number one. We had all the interaction, we used all the interaction, the opponent died. That's the way this deck wants to play, and that's what happened. Let's go to game number two. Apologies for the uh, sniffling. I've been a little under the weather this week, but toughen it out to get a video out to you guys. So, uh, Game number two against our mono blue Delver opponent here. You can see not a ton changed. We just took out the two Rancors for the two Dispels. Um, in hindsight, I think we should keep these Rancors and potentially bring in two Dispels for the two Cyber Cryptomancers, maybe. Um, I think in general, those are going to be kind of the same spell, but one costs more than the other um, against this matchup. And we're not really worried about Edicts or anything like that, so I don't think we need to worry about the body. Um, but the Trample can be relevant, especially because we saw those Murmuring Mystics in this. Uh, discard pile from the opponent in game number one so a little bit of a, a change in sideboard plan i think going forward but for now this is what i rolled with in the moment we do see a keepable seven but it is risky obviously we are on a single green here um this is a risky keep, I'll be honest. Um, if I was not up a game, I probably would not keep this hand. But we elect to keep this hand, and we roll with it, hoping to draw a green source, uh, or a blue source, to be honest. Both are good. We are in a very strong position, though, if the opponent doesn't have early interaction or an early blocker. If we can lead on this Glistener Elf, this is a... Kill on our turn three uh, in a vacuum. So let's play it out and see what happens. Opponent leads on a Delver. And we hit an Ash Barons, which is actually a reasonable draw for us. Opponent does not flip their Delver, which is good. We just lead the Glistener Elf out. Opponent does not attack. Although I think they should offer the draw here. We get a second green source that just seems appropriate with what our what's in our hand. Um, we want to keep a hexproof source open for like a cold boomerang or something like that. Opponent doesn't flip Delver again, which is great for us, and still does not attack, even though I think they should. Uh, we hit another snakeskin veil, which is pretty awkward. In this instance, we do just go for the cold attack here. We go for Might of Old Croja over something like a Snakeskin Veil initially. Um, just to eat one of the Delvers. And we have several of the pump spells. So we're not really anticipating getting to cast all of them anyway. Uh, we just go to eat a Delver there and start to chew into their blockers. It looks like they're on a defensive plan. So I'm going to play the aggressive here. Um... They do have a spell pierce for the pump spell, which is unfortunate, but we're able to just stick a snakeskin veil, which gives it a 1 1 counter. And I think ultimately that's going to be a bigger priority for us because now we can attack into Delver, uh, an unflipped Delver, without offering a trade, and that's pretty important. Opponent cycles a Lorien revealed, just gets a land drop. 
opponent still not flipping their Delver, which is crazy unfortunate for the opponent. Uh, but now they do attack. That signals to me a boomerang maybe or an echoing return or something of that nature. Um, no reason the opponent should attack there when they didn't any other turn if they didn't have gas here. So we go for the Might of Old Croja here. We pump just to six uh, and attack looking for the potential lethal here if they only have one interaction spell. Um, but it is safer to just attack for six and try to stick this damage in. We could absolutely go for lethal here, but if they have like boomerang and a counter spell, we're kind of sunk. So we have to just attack for six, set up a two turn clock here. Opponent does have the boomerang. We're able to have vines of vastwood here. Now we could have snakeskin veiled initially, but we were anticipating a counter spell or some sort of a spell pierce or something like that. So we didn't kick it and we wanted to resolve the 1 1 counter instead. <coughs> uh, and that's still going to get in for seven and put the opponent one hit off of lethal because it's going to be a 3 3 when the pumps wear off. So if at any point the opponent does not have a blocker, we're in it. And we could hit a uh, Rancor here that would give us lethal outage, but unfortunately we did cut two of them. Once again, that is a mistake, I feel. Um, we should have cut the Cyber Cryptomancers. So if we see either of those in that game, uh, we would know we should have Trample instead. Opponent just hits for one again. We attack for three to induce this block. Now, we don't have to go for the Embiggen here. Um, and in hindsight, maybe we're not supposed to, um, because it would just make it, what, a 0-2 uh, with the Infect Neg 1, Neg 1 counters, but we don't want the opponent to get a bunch of spells off and generate a bunch of birds, so while they're tapped out, we go for the kill. Um, still really hoping to hit a Rancor. But ultimately, we're kind of on top deck mode now. This Dispel is largely going to sit and hit another Boomerang, but we're really just hoping opponent doesn't have another blocker so that we can stall out the game. Opponent flashing back, hits a Brainstorm, and there is the blocker we were afraid of. Unfortunately, this is a bit of a stonewall for us without another Pump Spell. Um, we do hit a Relic's Roar, Unfortunately, Relics Roar only leaves us with five toughness after the two one one counters, so it's a trade with Telerian Terror, which is super unfortunate. Opponent does have a Delver of Secrets, though, and this Delver of Secrets actually induces a misplay from the opponent. They attack with this Telerian Terror, which would allow us to have lethal with any Trample Source. Um, don't think I think this attack was overly aggressive from the opponent, but maybe they didn't have the resources in hand to race. We do have the Dispel for the Boomerang. We're going to eat another Delver and play a second Glistener Elf. Uh, this is what I was hoping with this Glistener Elf play was that the opponent could no longer attack with both creatures because it wasn't presenting lethal. Um, if I block and they don't have another blocker, they're dead, so they obviously couldn't attack with both. Unfortunately, they did have another blocker, which is kind of the nail in the coffin here. We have one more chance at drawing a uh, Rancor for the lethal out here with Trample over this 5 plus Relics Roar. So we go for the block here to live and see what we top deck. Unfortunately, we just draw a creature. And that is kind of all she wrote here. There was an option, and I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll discuss it, I guess, um, to Relics Roar, the last Glistener Elf, to reduce this Talarian Terror to a 1-1, one, one, which would allow us to block with the Glistener Elf and only take three here to go to one. Um, there are benefits to that plan, and... Maybe it draws an out, um, but unfortunately, I went for the hold Relics War and die line instead. Um, and that's exactly what we do. We hold the Relics War. They have the extra creature, so it wouldn't have mattered. 
and uh, we go to game number three. All right, we go to game number three against our mono blue opponent. Still with the Rancors in the sideboard, still a bit of a mistake. Again, I have updated my sideboard plans against mono blue. I do not think this is correct. I think you just cut the side of Cryptomancers. Um, but we are on the play this time, which is a huge improvement for the win rate of this deck. So let's see what the opening looks like. Unfortunately, this is not a keep. If this was if this was a forest, or if this was a forest, or if really any card but Glistener Elf was a forest, this is an insta-keep. Unfortunately, it is not a keep, so we have to mulligan it. This is a much <laughs> more awkward keep, but it is a keep. We're going to throw back one of these Blighted Agents, and let's get it rolling. We just lead on an island. We're going to cycle the island for a forest. Opponent has a turn one Delver like they did last time. We have hopes that it doesn't flip, but it does. Uh, that's fine, though. Opponent can't block the Blighted Agent, so it is a bit of a race now. Opponent just going to start the clock. Not afraid. We hit a Rancor, but elect to just attack with the Blighted Agent. Play a second one. This minimizes their boomerang outs. And if we can draw a second green source, then we're in a really good place to start applying pressure. We hit a Dispel, which is like a second green source um, because it is still boomerang protection. So we equip and just start to apply pressure here. Opponent is dead on the next turn if we hit a green source. Unfortunately, we hit a Shadow Rift, which is not what we're looking for. We have to keep this blue open. Opponent goes for Boomerang. We go for Dispel to see if they tap out for something like a Spell Pierce here. Um, since they do not, uh, before damage, we just go for the Snakeskin Veil to kill. Unfortunately, opponent has a Force Spike. We still get in for four. Opponent is going to one in fact remaining and they don't have a way to answer both blighted agents so they scoop it up that is a mono blue win in the books and uh, i do think this matchup is pretty good for this deck i do just think i need to sideboard correctly and uh, game two would have been much better for me uh anyway guys that is it for the regulation games let's go to the special game now this was a very strange game against meme lord macl or meme lord salt uh we win the die roll so we are on the play but you will see exactly what makes this game so weird buckle up grab a drink uh and come back because you're gonna be here a little while this is gonna be a wild ride so buckle up we are on the play this is a keepable hand let's get it rolling Unfortunately, we're in another one of those awkward-ish spots where we have a choice between Glistener Elf unprotected with no information get about the opponent's deck, or we can just lead with a forest, get an island, and then play a Glistener Elf with Spell Pierce protection. Um, very interesting point. Since I don't know what the opponent is on, I elect for the safer option because I only have two creatures and I don't have any pump spells. Unfortunately, we see a Volatile Fjord here. That puts me on a Blue-Red Scred from the opponent, which is a highly interactive matchup. They have kind of the best of both worlds. They have all the cheap removal from Red, but they have the counter spells from Blue. Uh, th this is going to be a tough matchup, I think. Uh, we do go ahead and cycle for the island at the end of turn. We top deck a Cryptomancer, which is an interesting draw because it gives us outs to removal again. We do go for the Glistener Elf here, knowing we have the Spell Pierce back up. Unfortunately, this is bad to an enemy Spell Pierce or an enemy Bolt Bolt. Uh, end its turn, or main board, main phase, sorry. We're going to top deck and cycle in Ash Barons to hit a second blue. That just seems to be the way we're going to have to play this here. Opponent goes for the Flame Slash on the creature here. We Spell Pierce one. They just pay for it, and we Spell Pierce it again. Now, this is a small learning curve. 
um, for this deck and something that is noteworthy for those who are going to be playing it after me. Um, if you have multiple infect creatures in hand, all it takes is one. If your opponent is spending resources killing one of your redundant creatures, you should be making them pay the tax but letting them kill the creature. I should not have invested both spell pierces here, I don't think. Um, because it means that after I play this Blighted Agent, I am, for all intents and purposes, out of gas. I do have this Cyber Cryptomancer, which can pump one of them. But ultimately, I just don't know that I'm going to be able to get it done. And because I have no more protection in hand with spell pierces for things like, uh, you know, damage or tar uh, untargeted removal, uh, like Fiery Cannonade or, you know, something like that. I think this is going to be a pretty tough game. But I think maybe I should have let this one die after they tapped out for it. Because I knew I was getting a time walk out of it. Unfortunately, we draw a land there, which is pretty unfortunate. But we're just going to play the Blighted Agent and keep this Cyber Cryptomancer up. Opponent foretells a card and just passes back. We hit a Rancor, which is pretty good for us. We're just going to play the Rancor. We were hoping that they would go for the kill spell on the creature in response, but unfortunately they do just have a counter spell, so our pressure is a little bit lacking. We do just get to attack for two more poison, though. We're going to cycle. This allows us to open up a Lorien Revealed if we do draw one, although into counter spells it's probably not going to resolve anyway. We just want to thin our deck as much as possible so that we minimize our land draws. Opponent reveals that they are on Grixis. And plays a Behold the Multiverse and then Breath Weapons. Now this Breath Weapon is super punishing because we have no way to save any of our creatures even with this Cyber Cryptomancer. And we didn't have the buff spell until the next turn, which is brutal. Uh, we draw the Might of Old Croja, but that means that we do not have any Infect creatures left. So we are on top deck mode and we're just waiting to see what the opponent's win condition is at this point. Opponent plays the land, and then just passes back. At this point, we just draw a land and pass back because we are out of gas, but the opponent has six cards in hand, so we're really just trying to figure out when they're going to start applying some pressure. Opponent leads on a preordain, but then passes back again. We once again hit a land, pass back because we are out of gas. Opponent just draws a card and passes. We hit yet another land and pass. Opponent brainstorms at end of turn, cycles Nash Barons, plays a land, and passes. So at this point, we're wondering what the opponent's win con is, or you know, maybe they're just digging and they haven't gotten one for some reason. But we're going to continue making these land drops and passing back. The opponent is sitting on seven cards in hand. And... Now the opponent's discarding. So wait a second. What, what's the plan here from the opponent? I'm not seeing a win condition. I don't see I don't see them applying any pressure. If they had a creature, they surely would have played it by now, right? Well, we draw, we pass back. They pass back. We draw, we play a land, we pass back. They pass back. Where is this match going, I'm wondering at this point? Do, do they have a win condition? Are they just on the worst draw imaginable? But then I start to see what they're discarding. A Chainer's Edict, a Flame Slash, a Mystical Teachings. They are probably the greediest kill spell control deck I've ever seen. So if that's the plan, if the opponent is a kill spell control deck, then we have to amass a hand that can resolve a creature and then guard that creature just long enough to hit them basically one time. And they're gonna die. They're at four in fact, we just need one good attack. And they're gonna die. Um, so at this point, it becomes a draw-go match. We are gonna start sculpting our hand until we can get them to commit to a counterspell or... Until we can commit resources into this Cybo Cryptomancer because it is a hexproof body. Maybe we can win this through regular damage. 
that might be an option. So let's see where it goes. Opponent discards, passes back. Again, we draw, we discard, we pass back. Still no creature besides the Cryptomancer. We need at least one creature to follow it up with. We discard, we pass back again. At this point, we're starting to sculpt our hand with only protection and pump spells. So we start to get rid of these relics roars. We don't need them. We draw a dispel. That's really good for us. We discard again. We hit a shadow rift. That's less useful. We discard again. Opponent still on the draw pass discard plan. At this point, they have discarded several lightning bolts and a scred. We hit a land. We pass back. T time is still very tight. We only have a couple of seconds on them. At this point, we hit our second creature. We pull the trigger. We go for a Cyber Cryptomancer. We see if it resolves. It does resolve. We go for a Blighted Agent. And we go for this in the main phase for one reason. Because they have a Chainer's Edict in the graveyard, we can't let them set up a board state where they can just immediately flash that back to kill our Hexproof guy. Opponent goes for the Breath Weapon here, and we have lots of action. Now, we can just dispel this Breath Weapon, but opponent likely has a Counterspell. We are so, instead, we are going to Might of Old Croja to pump our creature so that it doesn't die, and then dispel the Breath Weapon. Unfortunately, they have a Counterspell again. Opponent committing a lot of resources to this breath weapon. We go for a Relics War. That'll pump it out of its range. They counterspell again. Lots of investment into this play from the opponent. We Vines of Vastwood kicked to buff this by plus four, plus four, so that it doesn't die. And we go for the um, Snakeskin Veil on the Cyber Cryptomancer to give it one extra counter that way neither creature die to the breath weapon and it looks like they're finally out of responses we keep the embiggen though so that we can kill a creature or so that we can uh, present a lethal threat with any other pump spell off of this blighted agent if we survive long enough to play it opponent down to three cards though so we have a reasonable chance to sneak something through now Opponent untaps, goes for a Lorien Revealed, and a Flame Slash. They set it up. We do present some damage now with the Cyber Cryptomancer. Maybe we commit to the plan, but as we suspected, they are indeed going to flash back this Chainer's Edict to get rid of it. So, now it becomes a, another round of Draw, Go, Sculpt Your Hand. Opponent does a lot of card drawing here. They're mystical teachings, but we always just see a removal spell. They get another Chainer's Edict, and then they play a Lantern of Revealing, which is very strange. This is an artifact that allows them to add one mana of any color or look at the top card of their library, and if it's a land, they can put it onto the battlefield tapped. If it, uh, if you don't, you can put it on the bottom of your library. Um, very strange card choice here. Definitely feels like some sort of very greedy control. And then I look at the opponent's deck size. And I wonder, at this point, whether or not they started with 60 cards. We may have to go back in the replay and look. You guys can slide back and check. But look, to see if they start with 60 cards. Because I notice I'm down to 25 cards and I have no card draw in my deck. I am just playing draw go. They are at 38 cards and they have drawn several cards and used Mystical Teachings, Lorian Revealed, etc. So it occurs to me that they may be on some sort of a deck out control deck. Which is very interesting but also very strange because MTGO runs on a timer. At this point, we have about two minutes on them in time advantage, so I start to wonder whether or not they have a way to kill me, or if this is just going to go to time. Uh, let's find out. We do commit a Blighted Agent here. We probably should have continued to hold, but I didn't want to give the opponent too much time to rebuild. They had just used a Mystical Teachings to find a Chainer's Edict. Um, 
But at the end of the day, I thought that it might be able to resolve. Realistically, it was never going to live. Um, at the end of the day, I should have just held it and waited for another Cyber Cryptomancer or a secondary creature or something I can back it up with. But I was always going to run into Exclude, so at the end of the day, uh, my Spell Pierces are pretty much dead, so it's going to be Dispel or nothing. And I only have one Dispel left, and I only have one Cyber Cryptomancer left, so it's going to be a while till I get there. 25 cards left in deck. An opponent starts Lanterning. This is ultimately going to cost the opponent a lot of time because I notice they start to do it at the end of every turn. At this point, I'm just passing through my turns very quickly. I'm putting a lot of time pressure on the opponent. I've built up almost two and a half minutes now. And the time very quickly starts to run away from the opponent. This is going to become a game of biding my time quite literally until I have a hand that I can commit to the board with and, or my opponent runs out of playtime. Let's see where this goes. There is a pretty epic turn coming. Once again, we are just on the draw go plan. We are on the out of creatures struggle bus. Uh, we are going to continue to draw until we hit another double creature commit. Not that I think it's going to matter. Uh, looking at what they have in their hand, but they have Think Twices here. They have started to discard again. We are about to go to discard as well, but we draw land, so we just keep passing back and forth, trying to see what the opponent is trying to do here, waiting for them to show us a way they are going to kill me so I can scoop and we can go to the next game. We do hit another Cyber Cryptomancer and Blighted Agent combo, and they are very dead if that Blighted Agent ever hits the deck end of turn we go for the side of cryptomancer again untap equip it with rancor go for the buff and attack now this was designed to um see if the opponent had a way to kill at instant speed through hexproof because if they didn't we did have lethal damage there but they're able to tutor for a diabolic edict which is so backbreaking that was kind of the game plan there. Fortunately, they let us get Rancor back. I suppose they could have whiffed it. But they do have another exclude for the di or for the uh, Blighted Agent. They activate Lantern of Revealing yet again. But they continue to just pass back. So really running out of options for the opponent. We go for a Glistener Elf here and it resolves somehow. Um, and then we go for a Rancor in which they bolt it. Uh, to the bolt, we embiggen to survive the bolt, but then they drop a Scred for something like 12 damage, uh, which we are just not able to fight. So they finally get this Rancor out of our hand. We hold this Lorien Revealed just to not accelerate our deck out timer because I do think it's going to go that long at this point. We draw a Relic's Roar, which is fine. Unfortunately, it's not going to be surviving any lightning bolts, which is unfortunate unless we can get a 1-1 counter on something. And then opponent shows us a pristine talisman, so we know the regular damage is not going to get the job done anymore. We hit a dispel, which is great. That's the last dispel in the deck. We're going to need to make that count. And we are back once again on the draw-go plan. What is this opponent trying to kill us with? I don't know. But we are going to try to stick around and find out. Back on the draw-go plan. Opponent just passing with all their mana available. We draw another pump spell. <coughs> draw-go back and forth again. We draw another pump spell. But we now we have a dispel, a snakeskin veil, and three pump spells. So once again, we are in a position, if a creature resolves, we can fight over keeping that creature in play. We hit a Spell Pierce, which is a dead card, essentially. Um, but we don't discard the Spell Pierce, which is a little shaky for me. I think in retrospect, I definitely should have discarded the Spell Pierce, but I'm imagining some sort of tap-out win condition, maybe a Caravex Torch or something to nuke me from 20 here. Really waiting for the opponent. I mean, they're down to 16 cards. We've got 9. Uh, really waiting for the opponent to just show me how they're trying to kill me. 
um, so that we can try to play another game here. You can see I've built up a sizable time advantage, uh, about five minutes of difference now. But opponent just continues to uh, untap and pass the turn back, really trying to live up to their name here with the meme lord status because they are cooking up something with this deck. Uh, we go for the Glistener Elf here just so we don't have to discard it. Um, maybe a mistake, um, but they do have the Exclude. We go for the Dispel on the Exclude. They have, they have a Dispel for our Dispel. We were never beating that. But that means we are basically out of counter spells for this game one list. So we're really going to have to hope they don't have another counter spell. And we're able to stick a creature if our game one win uh, goals are still in. We do top deck a Glistener Elf. I think if we go back and take a look at the graveyard here. One, two, three Glistener Elf. So that is the last Glistener Elf. And then we have one, two, three... Four Blighted Agents and both Cyba Cryptomancers in the graveyard. So this is the last creature in the deck in the main board. And they let it resolve, which is a breath of fresh air. We have a lot of spells to fight them on a removal chain for. Um, hopefully they let us get to that point. It looks like they're going to pass the turn back with all their mana. Once again, discarding to hand size. And it is time to fight. Let's see how this goes. We have a land. We attack. We do not try to resolve this Might of Old Croja during the main phase just to not open the door to uh, bounce or something like that. But I suppose we should have. Uh, realistically, it would provide a, um, a bigger uh, win percentage probably. But... It allows us to play around some things, like if we resolve a Relic's Roar and they're trying to bolt it, we can Might of Old Croja it, things like that. But we're going to have to play around some Screds here, so these Snakeskin Veils are going to be really important. So we have to be pretty sparing. Um, we go for the attack. They try to terminate it. Unfortunately, we cannot buff our way out of a Terminate, so we have to Snakeskin Veil here. Opponent follows up with the Lightning Bolt. Well, that's okay. We can answer that with an Embiggen. Opponent follows up with a Scred. Well, that's what this other Snakeskin Veil is for. Opponent goes for a Mystical Teachings. Opponent goes for another Scred. 15, you say. 15 is the number we have to beat. We go for another Embiggen. Opponent flashes back the Mystical Teachings. In response, we go for the Relic's Roar. This is going to ensure that if this Embiggen resolves, it's going to give an extra plus two plus two, which allows us to potentially get over this uh this scred opponent looking through their deck realizes they do not have another kill spell for the glistener elf and scoops it up we manage to fight through this deck on the very last creature in the main board with five cards left in deck we steal it out with a lethal swing from four infect GG's to the opponent. What an epic game. <laughs> and the opponent scoops the match because they're out of time. Wow, what a game. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Thank you so much for watching through to the end. If you made it to the end, whoo, what a wild ride. Comment below what you think of the deck and what you think our opponent's win condition was because I am dying to find out. Opponent dropped from the game before I could ask. Put your predictions for what the win con was down in below. I want to see what you guys are cooking up, what they could have been cooking with. 
And uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Once again, we are so, so close to 1,000. Very excited for that. Hopefully, we have a 1,000 sub thank you video coming out in the next week and dropping some merch in celebration. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much, as usual. Goodbye forever, unless I see you next time. Peace.